Uh, my name is Alim Salami. I was born in Arizona and I originally moved here when I was about three years old. Uh, I was born a Sunni Muslim and I've been raised my whole life as a Sunni Muslim. But uh, when I turned about 17, 18 years old, I started wanting to learn more about my religion. I started questioning things and after about a few months of deciding which path is the right path for me, which one is more convincing, I eventually chose the School of Ahlul Bayt. Until about a few years ago, I hadn't really met, I've only met with uh, Sunni Muslims. Not because I chose not to meet with Shia Muslims, it was just the majority of the people in this area or the area that I lived in were Sunni Muslims. Um, growing up, I just, I basically, most of the things that I was learned was basically, was basically just law, like what's halal, what's haram, etc., things like that. And then eventually I just, I, that path wasn't really the right one for me. Like I wanted something more spiritual, something that could get closer to my heart. So I eventually I just started listening to more lectures and then after a while I came to the school of Ahlul Bayt. When I was growing up, uh, I was told a lot of misconceived things about Shia Muslims, mainly that uh, they don't believe that the Prophet ﷺ was the last Prophet. They believe that uh, Ali was the, supposed to be the Prophet instead of him. And unfortunately, I have to say that I kind of fell into those traps that were laid for me. I started believing those things and I kind of started acting out on those things in the sense that I would spread like that uh, rhetoric to my friends and to other people around me. So yeah, I just spread that type of uh, rhetoric to people around me. And, but alhamdulillah, now I started to learn actually more about what I was thinking and what I had been taught and I found out that it wasn't the right thing. Um, being from Nigeria, mainly, I'd have to say that there were Maliki Muslims. So the, but when my parents moved here, I feel like they became more Shafi, Shafi slash um, almost uh, having like small hints toward the Salafi movement. Um, growing up, uh, they just told me like bad things about the Shia. And they just have, like even until today, they have very negative connotations towards uh, people of the school of Ahlul Bayt. Basically, I was just tired of learning the exact same thing over and over again. Basically, what's halal, what's haram, what you can and can't do. Like having those things said to you over and over again, it's almost like, okay, I've learned this. Let me move on to something else. So basically, my, uh, my story about coming to the school of Ahlul Bayt it was basically an accident almost because I was watching um, just random videos on Islam on YouTube and then in the related videos I just saw a video by um, Sayyid Amar Naqshawani and I just clicked on it by chance and the video was on, if I remember correctly, the merits of Imam Ali and the things that he said at first it was kind of like no, that's wrong, that's wrong, like, where, where are these people getting this information from? So basically, um, there's a website called uh, sunnah.com. It has, um, I believe, majority of all of the hadith that's in uh, Sahaha Sitta, which they, um, the Sunnis claim is the most reliable books of hadith. So I just went to the search bar, I tripped um, Ali, and lo and behold, a lot of merits came under his name. I started watching more and more videos, and honestly, I'd have to say that I felt a little betrayed that we weren't learning all of the merits of Imam Ali. Some might say that uh, he was just one person and it wasn't important, but the merits that the Imam had, it's, it's uncountable. Like, you can't just uh, move it, push it to the side and say, it's not very important because the merits that he had, like for example, uh, one thing that I learned when I was converting was when the Prophet said, uh, Ali is to me like uh, Aaron was to Moses, except that there's no Prophet after me. To some, uh, they might say that, oh, it was just that the Prophet was saying that Ali was just his brother. But the position that Harun had with Musa in the Quran, it's completely different than just saying that uh, Ali was just the brother to the Prophet. The position that uh, Harun had to Musa, 
the position that uh, Harun had to Musa, it was a prophet to prophet level. But the, as the prophet said, there's no prophet after me. So there has to be a position under a prophet, but that's higher than any other human being that the Imam had. Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's more of what the prophet said, but it's more of what the Imam did for Islam. Like, for example, all of the battles were basically won by the Imam Ali. And like the Battle of Badr, uh, Khaybar especially, um, it was just things like that that just made me basically fall in love with the Imam. Um, basically, I would have to say probably the whole thing took about two to three months. Just watching more and more videos from different scholars from both the Sunni and the Shia, having to learn what each of them say about the other. I found that uh, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, they were more accepting, I'd say, of um, the Sunni school. They'd say that they just have a different belief and we have ours. But on the Sunni side, they'd say that this is our belief and whoever disagrees, then they're on the wrong path. Um, over the course, as I said, over the course of about two to three months, watching more and more videos, I did... Um, I just had a lot of time to think to myself that is what I'm getting into the right thing because if it's not then that could lead to a lot of um, basically a lot of like bad things that happen in the afterlife but then if I decided that if it is the right path then the bounties are the bounties outweigh the cost basically so Basically, firstly, for about a month or so after I converted to myself, I didn't really tell anyone. I just kept it to myself, just learning more and more things. But then after about a month or so, I started to open up more to my friends. Not in the sense that I'd openly come out and tell them that, hey, I'm Shia. But I'd say that this is the history. What do you th This is the history that contradicts what we've been taught so far. What do you think about this? And unfortunately, I'd have to say that many of them weren't very accepting of it. They just blow it off and say that it's not important and things like, like that. And then after about another three to four months, that's when I decided to small, um, subtly open up to my family. In the same way, I'd ask them like subtle things like, this is what happened in history, what do you think of this? And unlike my friends, some of my family members, they were very, very harsh towards like the criticism almost. And they took it as kind of like an offense to them. So I basically, I stopped asking questions to them. And now, for now, they don't exactly know that I follow the school of Ahlul Bayt. The toughest part I'd have to say is praying with them because um, I've read from different scholars they say that if you're in a, um, if you're in a period of taqiyya then you can pray like the Sunnis but for me personally I don't feel comfortable praying like that so I decided to pray with my hands down but uh, the thing is in my culture sometimes like people they wrap themselves with cloths and stuff so that's basically what I do. I just wrap myself in a cloth and I pray with my hands down. And in regards to a turba, I just hold it in my hand. And when it's time to go for sujood, I quickly place it down. I do my sujood and then I pick it back up in my hand. On a personal level, I'd have to just say that I feel a lot more happy, more content with what I'm learning and just the things that happened over the course of my life. Like, for example, um, when I have had hardships in my life, I just look back into the difficulties that the Imam Ali faced in his life, and I say that if the Imam can go through it and he can triumph over it, then so can I. I'd have to say that it was probably about 90% was about Imam Ali, learning about his merits, what he did for the religion, what happened after the religion especially, or after the death of the Prophet. Um, but I'd say about 5 to 10 percent, I learned about the event of Karbala or the massacre of Karbala. And I learned about what uh, Imam Hussein did for the religion. He basically revived the religion and like, learned, um, taught people that 
what was being propagated wasn't exactly what the Prophet propagated. Um, I'd have to say that it was when the hadiths were brought into context with the Quran, um, especially if I remember the ayah correctly, um, ayah, uh, Surah 5, Ayah 55, where the Imam gave away his ring and uh, during his uh, uh, ruku, that for me was clear-cut evidence that the Imam was, or Imam Ali, was supposed to be the, uh, the successor after the Prophet. And for example, like most uh, Sunnis, they don't know about these things, or they've been told other things, or they say that there's difference of opinion, and since we don't know for sure, we're just going to leave it uh, as a blank ayah that doesn't have a tafsir. I think the, I'd say probably about 90 to 95 percent of the Sunnis, they don't know what we believe. But the ones that do, I believe it's just that they've learned so much about uh, Abu Bakr, uh, Omar, and Uthman. They've learned so much about them, about their merits. Um, so I feel that they have such an attachment to them that they don't want to let that go. So instead of letting go of them, they decide to attack the school of Ahlul Bayt. For the future, I'd have to say that one thing I do want to get at least some sort of formal education in religious studies, specifically Shia studies. Um, I don't think I would probably go to one of the seminaries in Iraq or in uh, Iran, but I think I'd go to a local one near me just to learn more about the religion. Um, eventually, a time that I think would be good to tell my family would be when I'm self-sufficient and I have my own place to stay. Because for now, the reason that I don't tell them is that I fear that I might get kicked out of the house. And if I do, I don't have a place to go or something like that. So I'd probably give it about another two to three years before I tell them. The first time I came here, I believe it was a week after I converted to the school of Ahlul Bayt. It was for Jummah prayer. I remember it specifically. Um, I came inside. I sat, I sat next to... Um, I forgot who it was. I, I sat down, I listened to the lecture. Um, it's just been such a blessing in my life. The people here, they're so nice, they're so humble, they're so welcoming. I remember on my first day here, as I was walking out, uh, someone came up to me and they said they hadn't seen me before. It was an older gentleman, very nice. Um, when I told him that I just converted, he was so happy that he kissed my forehead. Uh, I know this may not seem like such a big deal, but for me personally, I've dealt with a lot of racism in my life, and to have someone kiss my forehead, it's such a, a welcoming thing for, uh, for someone to do to me. So it was after that that I thought, this place is so nice, and they're so welcoming. So I started coming back more and more. And the Imam of the center, um, Sayyid uh, Mustafa Qazwini, uh, he's a very nice man, very humble. He has so much knowledge. with. And um, basically, I, just, I specifically like to come during his lectures. I like it when he gives speeches because the way he talks and the way he delivers his knowledge, it's just it's something that I haven't seen any other sh uh, sheikh do live. Uh, the first time I was introduced to the event of Karbala was when I was doing my uh, research. I stumbled upon a video by um, Yasser Qadi. He was talking about the event of Karbala, and basically he was saying that it was the Shias of Kufa that let down Imam Hussein, and they were the ones that betrayed him. And after that, I watched a, a video by another Shia scholar, I forgot who it was, but he explained it in such a depth that it wasn't that the Shias of Kufa, they let down Imam Hussein, because technically the term Shia is just a party of. So it can either mean a party of in a political sense or in a religious sense. And majority of the people of Kufa, most of them were quote unquote Sunni uh, during that time. So most of them, they were either bribed off or they were either scared away into not going with Imam Hussein. But the true Shias in the Kufa, majority of them were killed or imprisoned for trying to go with Imam Hussein. So, when I first learned about it, I wasn't saddened per se. It was more of 
anger that the Ummah could let this happen to the Prophet's grandson, someone that they claimed to love, they could let this happen to them. And so, so many people, so many companions of the Prophet himself were still alive at the time of the events of Karbala and they didn't say anything, they didn't stand up against uh, the Yazid, the ruler of the time, but they just decided that they were just going to remain quiet and live in their homes. When I first uh, learned about the way that they wail and they beat themselves, at first I thought that this was too much, like the man's already dead, there's nothing that you can really do about it. But then I started learning more and more about Imam Hussein, and the more I learned about him, I, like, I understood why they do what they do. Like they, ha they, were, they have such a love for Imam Hussein that every time uh, Muharram comes up or Ashura, they feel that it was just the same day or the day before that the Imam died. And this, it's such an accolade for a person to have that you can cry for something that happened such a long time ago. But it's, it shows almost like um, a purity in the heart almost. Imam Ali to me is just a, sh a pillar of strength. For me. So when I say that, I mean that his qualities, they're as there are so many, but the the times that he stood up in the face of adversity, it just it gives me a sense of I can do this also when I have uh, troubles in my life. It was during and after the battle of uh, Khaybar, when uh, the Imam Ali he was when Imam Ali he was feeling sick and he had um, an infection in his eye, and when he was brought to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet basically cured him. And after that, the Imam Ali, he had such a strength that he was able to lift the door of Khaybar. But then after that, he went home to uh, his wife Fatima alayhi salam, and he tried to break a piece of bread, and he said he, uh, he couldn't do it. And um, Sayyidah Fatima said, you were able to lift the door of Khaybar, but you can't break a single piece of bread. And his reply was just, it impacted me so much. He said, me lifting the door of Khaybar was for Allah but me breaking this piece of bread is for Ali. So basically I try to take that in my life saying that I have to do everything for the sake of Allah in order for me to truly be successful in my life. Um, a message I have to Sunni brothers and sisters is truly try to learn what you've been taught and analyze it and see that if it's the truth. And everything you've learned about the school of Ahlul Bayt, throw it away and actually learn from Shia scholars and see what they actually have to say.